students, a very healthy process. We can't thank the board enough for the heavy lifting that they have uh, exerted uh, in their volunteer capacities, uh, respectively, to make sure that we get the best candidate uh, for Eastern Shore Community College in the short and long term. So, uh, very important that we get your feedback. So, as we discussed with everyone yesterday, uh, the link on the website, if you prefer digital feedback, excellent, leverage it. Correspondingly, if you would prefer to have the paper form, Judith has those. Uh, the candidate feedback from yesterday, open today until 4 o'clock. If you didn't have a chance to provide that feedback, please take time to do so. Uh, Dr. Pagan, <laughs> we're uh, very fortunate to introduce today. Uh, overall, he's had, a, again, a very fun-filled day as well as his wife has had a very fun-filled day. So thanks to the volunteers that have helped to make those uh, visits for the candidate spouses fruitful. So we're thankful to them as well. I'll ask Dr. Bagan to uh, come up and give a self-intro. And then thereafter, we look forward to having uh, questions for Dr. Bagan. So we thank you very much for being with you, sir. Okay. Thank you, Well, as Mr. Holland mentioned, I'm Dr. Pagan. Uh, Richard Pagan, go back Rick. Um, been in this business um, for my age year, about 22 years. Uh, prior to that, I was in the Air Force, 20 years, retired after active duty ser service. I was actually stationed at Langley Air Force Base for 14 of those 20 years. So I know the Hampton Roads area. Um, been across the peninsula a couple of times uh, in my travels. Uh, but again, I started my teaching career in the Air Force. I taught as a master instructor at Advanced Electronic Systems in the Air Force for five years. Uh, was a, achieved the rank of um, Master Instructor through the Air Education Training Command. Um, so I uh, really enjoyed teaching, that's where I first fell in love with, uh, with this, this career uh, in terms of teaching adults and, and so on. Uh, from that I progressed into, uh, into, the, into academia and I started off as, as an instructor. Uh, during that time I taught in aviation, uh, avionics systems, as well as um, airframe and power plant. I'm certified by the FAA as an airframe air and power plant Tech technician, uh, and I also have my FCC cert certification as well. So I'm a very tech guy. Okay, so I understand everything from automotive. Uh, recently, uh, learned a lot about Allied Health. Uh, the programs that I oversee right now are part of your Allied Health, from uh, practical nursing to uh, physical therapy assistant. Uh, we have uh, medical assisting and all those kinds of programs. So I'm well versed uh, in those programs and the need that they have and the student that they serve. Uh, well, the technology, once again, um, I know the language. Uh, I can speak to instructors. And so that's probably one of the strengths that I have is that uh, because of my career technical background, uh, I can really talk and, and with really any, any faculty or instructor when it comes to what they, what they do and what they teach. Uh, and they don't have to be asking a whole lot of questions because I have that understanding. Um, electricity, all those kinds of things. So. Uh, so I did that uh, at Fremont State College, um, hired on as an instructor uh, and coordinator, and then from there I, um, I progressed through the years and was a senior, was a uh, sorry, full tenure professor, so I achieved that rank. Uh, in the meantime, just to kind of let you know about who I am, um, still raising a family of five, um, went to school full time, teaching full time, had a business on the side with my, with my wife, uh, and so needless to say, I slept very little in those years. <laughs> uh, but again, I appreciate the time. When we look back at that time, it's been it was a blast. So, um, but that really taught me a lot about uh, about what we can do as as uh, people and working with students. Uh, and so, when I left Fremont State, uh, I went on to become uh, I'm actually Pierpont Community Technical College. I went on to uh, go for technical <coughs> in Greensboro, North Carolina, as the division chair or dean of the Transportation Technologies Program. It's about a thousand students. Um, and again, diesel. Uh, so I became well versed with diesel programs, collision repair, automotive, um, you know, General Motors, um, ASAP, and Ford Asset programs, all those specialized programs. So I really got to know, and of course, on the aviation side of the house, uh, we had career pilot training, we had the avionics tech technology, we had the air, aircraft maintenance program, and customized training. So I really learned a lot in working with those folks, and that really also really helped me propel into the workforce initiatives. So I worked a lot with uh, industry in that area. On uh, the Triad region of uh, North Carolina, you have, um, you have what they call clusters. 
So uh, I was involved with the transportation and the aviation cluster and worked with those employers on growing that in, the, in that region. I uh, was on the North Carolina Aerospace, uh, the North Carolina Governor's Aerospace um, Steering Committee. Uh, and so just you know, listening to employers and you know, we can we can work with them. Um, started off the aviation council when I was there, invited those folks to the college and had them was hosting meetings there with them. Uh, so it's just those kind of things that really helped me to learn more about that side of the house. <laughs> so and all in all, now that I'm at the uh, at the current institution at the New River Community and Technical College as Vice President of Academic Affairs, and I just mentioned to uh, Mr. Holland that uh, I'm also the uh, I uh, oversee student affairs as well, so I'm now the vice president of academic and student affairs. So um, we combine that role. Uh, but again, it's, it's because I have some experience in those areas too. But um, the reason I'm here today is because I love what I do. Um, I like working with students. I like working with faculty and staff. Um, I didn't choose this as a uh, career. It kind of chose me when I started off in the Air Force. But uh, I really think this is, this is a great fit for me, and so I've been pretty much in the community college arena most of my academic career, uh, anywhere from instructor to where I am today. So I really have a strong understanding of, of the different departments, uh, what faculty do, what staff do, what student affairs folks do, a uh, strong understanding of, um, of an administrator, um, working with budgets and fiscal responsibilities and stewardship, of dealing with board members and those kind of things. So I really have that, I guess that, um, full circle view of what is a community college and why are we here, what is our mission, and as I shared earlier on, uh, our extreme, I believe strongly in the mission of the community college, which is to build an army of learners. And that's coming from the Association of, of Community Colleges, the American Association of Community Colleges. And that's what we're, we're about. So building an army of learners, not just for achieving academic degrees, but also workforce credentials. It all ties together. And as we're seeing the face of the landscape changing, uh, we're seeing that uh, workforce and academics are rising pretty much together, and now they're crossing over. So we need to poise ourselves to be able to work in that arena and ensure that what we offer, particularly at this school, uh, combines those, those two areas. When I went to um, an interview with the Chancellor's um, Leadership Group, uh, I recognized one of the individuals on the team, uh, Senior Vice Chancellor uh, uh, Morrissey, and I uh, heard that I worked together when I was in North Carolina. And, uh, and, uh, and the Chancellor did tell me, so, well, you know, we combined academics with workforce because we see that happening. Uh, and that's a smart move. So, you know, kudos to, the, to, your, to your Chancellor here for, for uh, doing that because he sees what's happening. Um, so this college is really at a place, and I, and I really enjoyed the last session working and talking with the uh, group there of faculty and staff. But this college is in, is in a unique position because now you're being forced to look at what you do. Not everybody gets that, gets that chance. But the only time you get that chance, kind of, is when you're going through an accreditation visit. You gotta stop what you're doing and make sure that you, you're meeting all the standards, right? But you're in a position now where, wow, this is where we are. This is what the assessment said that we need to do. And by goodness gracious, let's take a good look at who we are, what we're about, and where we're going. And make those changes so that we get to our destinations. Uh, my vision for it, I shared earlier on, was um, this should be a community college that is a beacon, a lighthouse of higher education on this peninsula. This is only one, to my understanding, other than you go up to Maryland, to the Eastern Shore. But this is it. So, should be bragging about this. Now, yeah, I look at Eastern Shore Community College because guess what? We do a great thing out there. And here's what we're doing. Uh, and reaching out to all the communities in the area. Um, so, uh, I champion that. Um, I will brag about things that, um, that I feel worthy to brag about, and that's something I would brag about here. Uh, we have a lot here. Uh, and it's okay to brag, okay? Uh, when you have something good you can brag about. And I think you're, you're in a position now where you can actually do that and say, there are changes coming out of the pike at Eastern Shore, but you know, we're ready for those changes, we're making those changes happen, and uh, we're looking forward to a bright future. You got this building right here. Beautiful building. I can already see it in my mind. You know, even though it's not finished, I can, I can envision it. Um, so it's just, it speaks to, um, to the, um, the confidence that the chancellor has with this, with this college uh, to make that kind of investment uh, and moving forward. So I think uh, you're, in a, you're in a good place. Maybe a challenging place right now. It's okay to be challenged, right? 
it, it's okay. So, so um, you don't get fit without doing exercise. So you may not like doing the push-ups, but at the end of the day, be glad you did them because you're more physically fit. So um, anyway, that's pretty much who I am. I am. I will say one more thing. Um, married, I have five children, all grown adults. So, but uh, it was it was great raising the kids, and, and I enjoy uh, our grandchildren as well. So. And five. Uh, I have Gons, seven grandchildren, right? believe it or not. Mm -hmm. But I tell my boys this: I have three, three grown sons. They're all taller than me. So <laughs> my, my youngest is six foot six. Good uh, gets from his mother's side. But anyway, um, that's, I will still challenge you today to give a basketball, and I'll still whip you. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, it's just having fun. But uh, uh, again, I want to thank you for this for this time, and uh, I guess we can open up for questions. Yes, sir. Okay. Thank sure. you, Dr. Richard. Robert. Yeah. Doctor, um, two questions. Uh, first would be, have you ever been in a position similar to this, not a college setting, but similar to this, where, where a reboot needs to take place? And in this case, because we are losing student population, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and that's no fault of the college itself, because uh, throughout the country, when, when the economy is strong, Mm -hmm. Community college population <clears throat> decreases when the economy is weak, it increases. So have you ever been in a position where a reboot was necessary with a new position that you were getting ready to, uh, to take over? And what did you do as far as trying to diversify, to bring more, uh, more people in? And the second question is, um, if you're chosen, uh, what would be your uh, goal for the first, your goals for the first 12 months? Okay. Fair enough. Um, Believe it or not, I find myself in that, in that, in that place today. I and mean, that's why I'm over student affairs. So at, uh, at our school, experiencing the same thing, drop in enrollment, uh, things are not working as they should be working. Um, and so I'm building a team, and uh, I'm going to uh, initiate a, uh, a rapid response enrollment team uh, to look at uh, and to get ideas from folks that you will normally ask to participate. So oftentimes, an administration, you sometimes sit back and think you have all the answers, but I'm, I'm smart enough to know that I don't have all the answers. And so I'm building this team to address those very issues, uh, and I'm gonna incorporate students from our Student Success Center, I'm gonna incorporate faculty, I'm gonna incorporate staff people uh, into this planning committee to look at how we can uh, really come up with some, um, some solutions to address those issues. Um, so this college is the only college facing the room of decline. Uh, there's been um, a decline in high school students. Um, but again, that's not really the target that we should be focusing on. Our target uh, should be on students that uh, are in high school that don't have plans to go anywhere. And there is about 40% of those out there that you have no idea what they're going to do when they graduate. Uh, as well as that 30-something uh, that crowd that, um, that's barely making it. You know, they have families and, um, and they're, they're one, one paycheck away from being poor. Uh, and work with those folks to provide them opportunities to enhance or get a credential to move forward and, and to get uh, to earn uh, a better, better living. Um, so that's part of that whole idea and how do you repackage, how do you uh, brand the institution? Because one thing I also notice across the spectrum is that it seems like everybody's doing the same thing. So if you go to community college A over here, community college C over here, they're all teaching the same thing, right? Uh, so I think we need to be a little bit more responsive and being a little bit different and providing some programs that maybe are not being taught in certain schools um, because you have that, that, that piece. There are four elements that really impact um, what a community college does. One is student demand. The other is uh, employer demand. The other is higher education competition. Other schools offer the same programs. And the last one is degree fit. So is what we're offering here at this school, does it fit our communities? When our students go through our programs, will they get jobs here? Or do they have to move elsewhere to find employment? Uh, and so that's something we have to look at and take a really hard, hard look. And there are, there are programs that we, we don't have here yet that we should have here. So that's something we have to address as well. So, so it's not a, um, I couldn't give you a one sentence answer, um, but uh, looking in from the outside in the short time that, that, I, that I've been here, there's got to be some look into what's best for the communities here the employers that rely on the, on the college for, for uh, entry-level employees and those kind of things. And how we reach out to those employers. I know that our workforce department is doing a pretty, pretty good job with that. 
um, but I do think that uh, having somebody in leadership that um, is out and about and visible is, is important too. Um, and um, as I mentioned to you, Mr. Holland, I am not, and I mentioned to the other group last time too, that you want someone who's going to sit behind a desk eight hours a day, I'm not the man. Uh, i got to be out working with people, meeting people, talking about the school and what we can do, and, um, and really selling the school, um, sharing why, not that we're least affordable than a four-year school, but the, we're the better value, and here's how we are. Uh, so getting that message across uh, to the communities is going to be important. And uh, I think um, having a person that can, that can move forward with that message and to move the college forward and, uh, and part of the leadership through these changes is also folks are unsure what that means. Uh, so I think uh, having a person that, um, you know, I learned early on in my military career that, um, that people look to the leadership uh, more for the confidence and composure if I'm falling apart, what message am I sending out to the, to the rest of the team? Okay, So you have to have a strong leader that's going to address those challenges and, uh, and address them in a positive light. I'm not a negative person. Uh, but I'm also a realist, and I, I will be very open and um, transparent in my communication uh, with the college community. And um, you know, so that people are, are, um, have a good understanding of what's going on. Um, I've found that. Um, the frustration happens when people, uh, one, are not listened to, and two, are not kind of left out in the dark and not being told what's going on. And you don't have to get down to the minutia and the, and the details, but you know, get the because. You know, this is what we're going through, and here's why, and this is what we hope to achieve by doing this. Uh, I think people are more than, more than, um, you know, at least I would say happy, or are, are, are okay with that. You know, and they come with you. Um, uh, to your to your second question, do you remember what that was again? Twelve months. What was Twelve months. Goal? Well, I would say, and that was a similar question I was asked in my last uh, last week. Uh, my first few months is to be out and about, <clears throat> learning the culture of the college, uh, learning the people that work at the college, learning the students, uh, then reaching out to the communities, uh, working with the workforce agencies, economic development boards, chambers of commerce, uh, and then reaching out to the employers in the area and really establishing uh, relationships early on. Uh, I'm not going to come here and, and really start changing processes and other than what's required on the, on the reboot that has, to be ha that has to happen. But um, uh, I feel that um, it would be a disservice to the college if I came here and started changing things quickly uh, without learning the college. So I will spend the first, that first year uh, doing what's required for the reboot, but also learning about the college and, uh, and, the, uh, and the culture of this, of this, of this school and the people that work here. Um, uh, you have to build trust. And uh, you can't have a winning team if, it, in the, if your uh, folks don't trust you. So I want to have to build that build that trust. And so that folks can, uh, I'm a very approachable person. So I hope folks can, will see that in me. Um, but uh, but I also understand that I have a charge. You know, uh, as the president of the college, I have a mandate and, uh, and I'm going to carry out that mandate. Um, again, it goes back to my, my mission, my military training. You have a mission to do and you do the mission. You do what it takes to get the mission done, and, uh, and I've done that. So, so I'm, I'm, uh, you know, I look forward to, uh, to be a part of the, a part of this team, and we're working with, with the people here, and really moving that college forward and being the, the lighthouse of higher education on this campus. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jenkins. I'm sure you did your homework, and mm -hmm. you know that this is the smallest community college mm -hmm. in Virginia. That the service region only has about half the population that you normally expect. To support a college. Knowing those things, tell me the major reasons you decided to apply for this particular presidency. Okay, uh, sure. Um, it was a challenge, I guess. When I saw the rebooting thing, and um, so I, I looked at that and said, "Well, this is an opportunity. I like challenges. Um, I don't like to um, have a job where I'm not challenged, you know, and that's why I kind of enjoy where I'm right now. Is welcome to our challenges." Uh, but that was one of the things that really attracted me to this rebooting thing and, you know, the, um, what that would in, in, in involve and, uh, and what that would take to make that happen and to come out the other end successful. Uh, so I like that, that part of it. Uh, I like where the college is, it is uh, on the, on the local, local location level. Um, it's on the eastern side of the country. Uh, all my children are on the eastern side of the country from Brooklyn, New York, down to Jupiter, Florida. So they're all right in there. Uh, and that's important to you, not just me, but to my wife. Um, you know, sharing time with our with our children and our and our and our, and our, our, our 
grandchildren is, is, is important. So that was part of it on a personal level. Um, but I just, the opportunity, um, it was just different. And I said, you know what, I think I, think I would enjoy going to a smaller school and, uh, and let's see if we can grow the school and see what it takes to, to make it what it needs to be. Um, but you're right, you're, you know, there are some challenges here. And it is a smaller school in the, uh, of the 23 colleges and across the system. But I, I, do think, I do think that the challenges that the school is facing are not insurmountable challenges. It's just going to take some work. It's going to take pulling up the sleeves and doing work. And I'm not opposed to that. So. OK, Roberta? Um, staying on that topic of challenges for a minute, um, what do you see from what you know so far and what you've learned so far as something that would be the biggest challenge for you here when you look at the different circumstances? Let's uh, pause for a second. I apologize. One thing I meant to ask everybody to do, introduce yourself in terms of what facet, my fault, not yours, um, what facet of the com community you represent. So catching up, Robert Crockett uh, is on the Board of Supervisors for Accomac County. Dr. Jenkins was president here. Okay. Uh, so uh, previous presidents, Dr. Glover, Dr. Stacy, Dr. Jenkins, correct? So three presidents ago. And Dr. then Roberta. Peggy. What's that? Dr. Peggy initially. Right. And then prior to uh, Dr. Jenkins, Dr. Okay. Peggy was the Great. first president of the college. And then uh, the Roberta Newman is chair of the foundation. Oh, great. great. The Eastern Shore Community College Foundation. Okay. So please uh, introduce yourself so we can connect dots as we go. Thank you. Okay. Well, obviously, I think the greatest challenge is enrollment, building enrollment. Um, as I was mentioning before, FTE is tied to dollars. So you have to have that enrollment growth. Um, so the challenge is, is to how well you can go about doing that. And how can you do it in a way that, well, you'll see the, uh, the benefits pretty, pretty quickly. Um, but I do think if you, uh, if you sit down and um, have a plan that's strategic and is targeted and really focus on certain areas, uh, again, look at certain demographics of, uh, of the population here uh, and reach out to those to that, to that market is, 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 is key to enrollment growth. Um, a lot of folks go after the dual enrollment students that are in high school, uh, but I mentioned before in other settings that um, typically those students that take dual enrollment classes are the ones that are looking to go to a four-year college. They're usually the higher achievers, uh, and so they're knocking out courses early on because that's how they are. Uh, and so the idea is of creating more programs uh, more courses, doing more pro, uh, courses that you can teach, you know, from the programs at the high school to entice those students that four year school is not really for them. So that's what you need to do as well to grow that that uh, that that fear for the college. Um, so there's different things you, you, you can do there. Um, then building that close relationship with the high schools, um, really changing the reputation of community colleges. Uh, again, there's a mindset out there that somehow we are lesser than a four year school. And I will tell you that all the credentials for an instructor here have got to meet the same credentials as an instructor over at ODU, based on SACS, right? So, uh, so uh, we need to make sure that, especially when it comes to uh, transfer courses. So that's important to know, that uh, the quality of education here is not any less than a four year. Actually, I think it's probably better, because you have classes are smaller. You have more interaction with the, uh, with the faculty. You have more hands-on. Uh, but that needs to be. Um, that message needs to go out as well because I think parents don't quite understand that. Uh, and you still with the term junior college. Well, junior college, what? University? Well, okay. It's a two year school. Okay. Different mission than the four year school. Uh, and that needs to be shared as well. And so we do things a little bit differently. But we're not any less than, of course, we just have a different mission, different focus. Uh, and our students come out and they're just as sharp as those graduating with the four year degree. So I'll put any of our students up against those those students. So, yeah. Thank you, Robert. Okay. Next question. Just a comment. Yeah, just a comment, then, Jeff. Uh, I like what you said about uh, need to get the, the meaning of uh, community college out there because most people look at a community college get you two years of basic courses and then go on to, um, mm -hmm. to a four-year mm -hmm. school. So I thought I'll, I like and appreciate your diversification of the school and making sure that the people know that it's just not a two-year school for basic mm -hmm. classes to go on. So mm -hmm. I appreciate that. And I'll share the history of, of that with the group prior. Because um, the history, it started back in, uh, in Europe um, 
the, uh, the two-year schools because at that time the professors did not want to teach junior level classes. They wanted to teach the high-end high physics courses, engineering courses, and so they created this, this two-year model. Um, so those folks can go through those two years and then they're ready to attend the, uh, the last two years with those, with those folks in those key areas. Um, so we've adopted that here in, in the United States. Uh, but what we do as a community college is, uh, and again, I've been in this business for a long time, is that, that it's, it's, it's unique in that, that we do that workforce piece. They, they four your schools, and they're getting some bad, I guess, rap on this because they were never designed, their mission was never about fulfilling the workforce. Right. That was never their mission, right? Except for certain disciplines, you want to become an attorney, you want to become an engineer, a medical doctor. Oh yeah, yeah, go to uh, to a uh, four-year school and middle school, whatever the case was, but that was their their mission. Uh, that's been the mission of the community college. Uh, when it when it transitioned from being institutes of technology to help out those um, veterans that came back from World War II to put them in jobs, uh, and then it morphed into being a community college or junior college. Uh, but that's been our mission. It's always been about providing education and training for workforce to get people back into the workforce to get them trained up so they don't have to spend four or five, six years getting an education. They didn't get come here in a couple of years. Knock that's it why out. you don't call it junior college. That's why I don't junior college. That's why a lot of schools have adopted this. They say community and technical college because it's, it's that technical piece is in there. That's, that's more your workforce career tech program, which we do a lot of. So, you know, it's, it's, um, it's a mindset that needs to be changed out there in, the, in how people view community colleges. Uh, and I will say that um, uh, on our end, we have not done a great job doing that because we still have that. We still heard that um, folks making comments about that. Oh, I don't like my kid to go to community college. It's not as good as boarding school. Then you ask them, well, who, who told you that? And where are you getting this information from? Um, so uh, that needs to be addressed and needs to really be um, set out that uh, no, we, we do a whole lot more than just transfer programs. And that starts from the leadership. Mm -hmm. Leadership going to Rotary Club meetings, mm -hmm. going to Chamber of Commerce meetings to get the message out there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so I'm a, uh, so I'm a champion for community college, always have been, and um, and I think it's very important that the uh, key leadership, being the face of the community college, is out there and sharing that message, and uh, making sure that people understand what we do, um, and what the benefits are of attending community college, even for those folks already employed. You know, there's there's uh, credentials you can you can pick up to enhance your career. They can do it to the community college. It's not all just about high school kids or, or you know folks that have been dis displaced, whatever. Um, so we serve a different demographic of students than you'll find at the four-year school, and that's why the four-year schools typically don't have an issue with retention and uh, those kind of things because those students have decided early on they want to go there and they're going to you know stay there as long as they, they, they can succeed and uh, move up. So you don't you don't see too many students actually dropping up. On the four-year side, but I do want to share this with you. So our our demographic, about well, the 7.4 million community college students across the country, about 70% require some form of remedial education. Okay, this is just community college students. Of those 70%, only 6% complete. Six. 6%. Yeah. Because. Again, we're, we're looking at a population of students that uh, the demographic is 20, 27 to 29 years of age, um, single parents, or um, they're, they're working. Um, the vast majority of the students are part-time because they're on work. Uh, they have to. They're, it's, a, it's a commuter school, right? So they come back to, work, uh, to the college. Uh, and so, so we have some things that are quite different uh, with regards to a four-year college that they don't have to deal with, uh, you know? There are very few community colleges that have residence hall. Um, four years could require typically freshmen to live on the campus the first year. Um, so it's, it's just a different experience. And so what we have to be is we have to be smart on how we deal with our students coming through our front door. We what are your thoughts that. on increasing that 6%? Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts on that? To, how, uh, how you well, you have to, uh, it starts off with being student-centered. So moving away from the current model of what we do, uh, how we do, how we advise students, getting more to a, uh, a success advising approach, because the students come to us with different problems, uh, different situations in their life, and um, you know, so you have to work with them. So so those folks in the student success centers uh, become coaches and mentors and everything else. And so uh, it's not just about advising your academic schedule and those kind of things. So it's more to that. 
So being more student focused in that, in that regard, uh, because what you want to do is you want to ensure that the students have a good experience with that. So any barriers that you can remove so they have a positive experience is going to help them. Uh, a lot of students come to us, uh, you know, their confidence is not there. Uh, so they're really intimidated by coming to, to, to college. Uh, and so we just have to be more welcoming, I think, to our students. Uh, get them through that process of um, admissions a little quicker. Ensure that they have what they need. And then I was mentioned before in the, the last meeting, the, the orientation piece of uh, providing more, more training on the technical side of the house. Um, because, you know, let's, let's face it, all online is here and it's going to stay here. As a matter of fact, it's probably going to grow. Uh, online services when, in terms of delivering courses via online platforms and so on. And so uh, being able to provide that training to our students on how to use those online tools, uh, how to log on to Blackboard and uh, check their email, all those kind of things. Um, if you start getting into interactive video networking where you're broadcasting from one area, maybe different areas, I think you have that with the ODU, right, I believe? Yes. Yeah, so, yeah right. so, so you're seeing more of that, and so um, uh, where I'm right, right now, we have um, we do quite a bit of that. Where we have an instructor in one on one campus that's broadcasting. They have a, you know, live students in front of them, but they're also broadcasting to the other three campuses. But they have students there too. So those students at the other campuses, they need to know how to work that equipment in case something happens. So they need to, you know, they need some training there. So I think we need to uh, really work on um, ensuring that those students that come to us. Uh, are properly oriented uh, on how to use all that all the tech, all the technology. We're using Zoom right now as well. Uh, Zoom is one of those platforms, and I'm sure if you all heard of Zoom, mm -hmm. so now we we use Zoom. So we are able to uh, to get some equipment purchased through through, uh, through Pell Grant dollars. Uh, so we offered it. Um, I believe it's three classrooms so far with Zoom equipment. And the nice thing about that is, IVN, which is Interactive Video Networking, is more restrictive. You have to be on that campus. Zoom is still live, but if a student has an issue, maybe a student has a child that woke up sick, they can't go to class. They can still log on to Zoom, and it's live class. They don't, they don't miss it. Um, maybe it's inclement weather, right? So the school is shut down, whatever the case is. Well, the fact you can still have classes via Zoom, because you're not, you're not tied to transportation. It's all you can do from your house. Now, the only issue we have with our right now, and I think you have some of that here, is since it's a rural community that we serve, um, internet access is, is a problem. And of course, probably more so in West Virginia because of the mountainous terrain, uh, getting internet um, broadband it's, it's, um, has been challenging. Uh, but that's been uh, an issue that we're trying to work with. But, um, but we do try to ensure that those students have access, at least they can't, um, they can't make it to the, the primary course on whatever campus, at least they can go to a site that has internet access they can uh, get on, get on Onto the classroom, but those technologies that are out there, um, you know, low, lower cost. Um, we're probably when it comes to the IBM equipment and uh, what's getting a little dated, and uh, Zoom is probably half the cost. And uh, and Zoom is just fantastic. I'm not sure if you guys have used Zoom, but uh, oh yeah, it's, it's it's a tremendous tool. So so that's where we have to go. Um, and uh, and again, um, typically our students that we get in community college. Need some hand holding initially, uh, but I think also if you work with them and you build how to build their confidence, that um, they will take off. But uh, I think it's just more more of that uh, and getting them the message out. And maybe give that student a feel that it's your job to get them through this. Mm -hmm. It's your responsibility. So mm -hmm. maybe that, that makes them feel better. And you know, I had a good conversation with the students this morning that uh, that were there for that for that session, and all of them. We're really uh, thankful and really expressed their, uh, their positive experience that they had here. They really enjoyed being here. And they're, they're moving on to graduating here in, uh, in the next week or two. Um, but uh, and I said, you know what? Please make sure that you thank some of your faculty. You know, because uh, it's, it's not easy. You know, and, uh, and they were very appreciative. And, you know, some of them mentioned names of some of the faculty they've had. They're really thankful. But go thank that person. You know, yeah, they're getting a paycheck, but it's nice to be appreciated. Right, so uh, so I think they're they're learning that, and uh, and I share some advice from them as well. But, you know, the human contact, and um, put down your smartphones every now and then, and talk to people. So uh, and that's something I've learned while I was uh, working with workforce is um, employers always to me, "Fuck the guy." Students, well, I have great technical skills. Yeah, but they just their soft skills are not, not there. You know, and so and you're and they're right. 
So you have to address that, you know, and um, decorum, proper dress, um, customer service, all those kind of things. That's part of it. Roberta? Building on that a little bit, when you look at this environment that we're in, which has got some really beautiful surroundings too, but part of being a, a student at the college is feeling good about when you walk onto this campus mm -hmm. that I feel like, hey, I, it's right, I'm here. I feel like home here. Mm -hmm. I feel welcome here. I feel like I can connect with people here. What are some of the things that, as you look at this campus, you would think you would like to see or that you could envision um, that really supported that kind of community feeling and camaraderie and connection? Mm -hmm. I think more involvement of the community by having events, hosting events here. And um, you, know, you want to bring people onto the campus, but they have to have a reason to come to campus. Um, oftentimes, we're, you know, we're, we're past the point now where we can't, um, we can't expect that we get students walking into our, our front door to for classes anymore. There has to be a reason to get them there, okay? So I think if you start to showcase the campus, uh, having some events here uh, for the community, get the community involved. Um, I talked about uh, establishing some kind of a lifelong learning institute for adult learners, uh, folks that run about for community class in other cases. You know, get people on the campus to see what, what's actually here. Because those are the ones that are going to go back, go back out to their communities and sell the campus for you. Uh, and so, uh, you know, I mentioned in the last session, I said, well, what is our, what is our greatest marketing tool? Students, right? Students that have been here. It's not these campaigns, I know Bill's a marketer, and, and he understands that, but, but students word of mouth. If they have a good experience, uh, oftentimes they, uh, they may express that if you ask them, but most times they don't say it unless you do ask them. But I will tell you this, the ones that have not had a good experience, they're going to tell them. They're going to tell their friends, they're going to tell their families, everybody. And so you don't want that. So you want to keep that, that control. So how do you change that mindset? Let's, let's be more student friendly. Let's, let's work with these students so they have a good experience. Um, but that's by far is the greatest tool that we have for going to college. Um, is um, not so much having those students speak well about us. And you want to see more Facebook comments about that because but they normally don't. Some of them do, uh, but you want to quench those that had bad experiences. You know, you want to get, get, get rid of that um, because that's a different college. Uh, and we mentioned early on in the prior meeting uh, the reputation of college. So never <laughs> over promise and under deliver. You know, and ask people on the workforce side because that happens a lot. Uh, but just make sure that you establish those communications with those folks out there and, uh, and sit down with them and, and see what it is that you can provide and maybe you can provide additional um, customized training for them later on after you look at the resources you do have and what it will take to do that kind of work. Uh, but again, it's just making sure that, that we live up to the name of being a community college. It is a community that we serve. Um, not just a community of students. You know, customers are not, are not just students. You know what customers are? Their faculty, their staff, their students. Anybody walks through that front door, the board is a customer of the college. So that's, that's the mindset we have to put ourselves in. That any person that I deal with is a customer to me. And I'm going to treat them with the most respect and courtesy to ensure that, uh, that I answer their question and provide the service that they're, that they're looking for. Uh, so you have that, that element that, that really plays into all this. Um, but I believe by far what's going to grow the college more is um, its reputation, it's the messaging that's sent out from the college of who we are, what we're about, and where we're going. Um, those kinds of things, getting it out to the community. Because it's, it's, it's the grandparents, it's the uncles and the nieces, you're going to tell, and the parents, it, you should go to Eastern Shore Community College. It's right here, you're right at home, uh, and if you just want to start there and do your two years, you get a degree or a certificate, Rick Hitchin, and you want to want something else, that's all well and good, but give them a shot. You know? But that's not going to change until we do what we need to do. Yes? Barbara Johnson, former foundation board okay. member. Um, I wondered whether you've had any experience, since you have talked a lot about increasing student enrollment where you are working now, mm -hmm. have you had any experience with looking to reach the parents and children, at, and particularly children at a younger age than high school? Mm -hmm. And many of the, it's a wonderful idea to make the environment more student friendly for those who walk through the door. Mm -hmm. But there are so many who never walk mm -hmm. through the door and don't even know the door's here. 
and their parents are not the folks that you're going to go talk to at Rotary. Right, right. Have you had any experience with that segment yes. of the population? Yes. So um, you're right. So the idea is to get into the high schools, and now it's getting into the middle schools. Planting the seed early on. You plant the seed. Uh, the best way to do that is to bring faculty with you that can talk about their programs. Uh, I can sit there and talk about nursing all day long, but I'm not a nurse. So it's better to hear from an actual nurse, right? Uh, and we've done that. In our Wally program, for example, um, I was able to purchase a, um, I'm not sure if we have that here or not, but uh, I was to purchase a simulator that's portable. And, uh, and so we'll take it out to high schools and, and, and that kind of thing, or career fairs, and students get to play with it. You know, they'll put on a little shield and they can actually do some welding or they can make them for custom repair, for painting of cars and that kind of thing. So having those kind of tools that we can take with us, uh, because students at that age, from middle school to high school, they like to the hands on things. They like to play with stuff, you know? And so, um, so when you can do that and kind of get them engaged, then you can talk to them. And so you can tell them at our, our school here, we have this tremendous program, and they talk about the program. Um, but I think there's got to be more of a presence in the high schools and even at the, at the middle schools with that. Um, yeah, we could talk to the counselors, but the counselors sometimes don't do it for us. Uh, we have to get in front of the students. And, and sometimes, uh, and I've done this where I've worked with a particular school, can I, can I have the time with, um, to talk with these students uh, about some of the programs that we offer in our community college? And we're walking around and say, sure, we'll give you, you know, 10, 15 minutes, whatever. Um, because that needs, that needs to happen. Uh, the more you're out there dealing with the high schools and with the middle schools, and the more you're out there dealing with the public, uh, you're going to get more attraction. Because you're right, uh, it's, and I said this before, those days where students are coming to the front door are no longer. Okay, we have to be more aggressive in how we reach out to bring students here. Uh, so there's different things we can do to try to grow that. And that's one thing we have to do, is work more closer to the high schools, uh, the middle schools, and plant those seeds early on. Anything in the elementary level? Well, you could probably do that as well, and then we, we actually have, have uh, done that. So we've created, um, sometimes we have a host, a, uh, like a summer event, and we'll invite families out. You know, uh, right now we're talking about, um, uh, my school I'm right now, we were having a, uh, a tech expo for our advanced technology center, and we invite, you know, families, employers, um, and we have some things there for the kids to do with that, and that kind of thing. Uh, yeah, it's always good. What are we going to do to get people on your campus is always the best. You want people to come to your campus, you know, and that's what it takes. And sometimes we have to, you know, invest, providing a little refreshment or, or food to attract people to come here, or whatever the case is. But the idea is get them here <coughs> and show them they can see for themselves what's being offered. Science fair. Well, was last weekend. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Who was the winner? We had, six, we had 61 entries. 61 entries, That's and wonderful. the winner was from what school? Actually, there were winners uh, K through 12. There were at least, what, five or six different okay. breakdown yeah. categories. So, yeah. That's great. That's great. 61 entries. Yes. And mostly elementary school. Mm. There you go. Okay. Dr. Jenkins, did you have another question? Could you, could you speak a little bit about your experience in fundraising and particularly <coughs> your relationship with college foundations that you may work? I'm doing more of that now. In my current position working with the executive director of the foundation. I was um, instrumental in, uh, in raising some funds for um, um, a program expansion when I was at the um, <coughs> Technical Community College. Uh, and so when I first got there, I noticed that um, they went out there. <coughs> One of our buildings, we had a lab space and we didn't have ceilings. It was this open labs, little six rooms. And uh, at that point, as I was kind of directing the aviation campus, it was on the aviation campus, <coughs> I asked the question, I said, so why can't we conduct classes in here? And the, question, and the answer was, well, because the FAA says you can't have, you can't teach lecture classes here because you don't have the temperature control and it's too, it's too loud. So, uh, so I met, I met the president, so okay, this, uh, this is what I like to do. And so I uh, working with the president, I was able to raise funds, and, um, and I got the physical plant folks involved. I said, can you drop some plans of what it will take uh, to do this work, and, and give an estimate for the cost. And so with that, and along with the president, um, of course, I was in a position where I didn't do the asking because that's the president's job. So, but, uh, 
but I supported him, and uh, and we were able to jointly ask for the for the funds uh, through a foundation, and uh, I think we got to nine hundred thirty-two thousand dollars for former expansion, uh, which is great. And so, uh, but I've done some other things too um, uh, when it comes to that. Uh, but but it's just there are there are three things you have to know about about fundraising is um, is three three different questions uh, before you do the final question being the asking. Uh, and I kind of alluded to that earlier on today about, um, about getting to know who that person is, you know, uh, sharing the, um, the value of investing um, to the school, and then the last thing is then you ask them. But, 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 and you have to do it in such a way that, um, that it really makes them want to give. Uh, because, you know, as I try to be a shrewd investor on my end, you know, I'll make sure, okay, what are the benefits to me? People are just, <coughs> People are thinking about themselves in a way, right? So, so why should I give, write a check to the college? You know, give me a really good reason why. And I think sometimes we fall short of that. Uh, we don't uh, really provide that, um, that clarity when it comes to the reasons why it's a good investment um, and the value that that adds to the, to the college. Uh, but I think it's, it's, again, forming relationships early on, um, building upon those relationships, and then getting folks to see, yeah, I want to be a part of that. <coughs> Other questions? All right, so we'll pause for a second on your questions. Any questions that you'd like to ask of the community leaders there? So you mentioned that the enrollment is down to about 500 students. So uh, what was the decline typically? Does it have, have to do with the boom of the economy, or has it been dropping for several years now? Well, we, I'm Judith for research planning mm -hmm. assessment. We had two things that happened. One was the economy. Okay. drop in the economy our numbers increased okay. and the other is that we do have a declining high school population while I also recognize that's not our only audience mm -hmm. that has been a big okay. um, factor okay. and um, for a while our programs I think uh, Dr. Sori addressed this this morning that we've reduced some of the numbers of course offerings that we have mm -hmm which made it less attractive for some of the folks who are in the community to come here and take classes. So, you know, your French too, or your, you know, mm -hmm. other things, mm -hmm. other nice things that mm -hmm. might attract other audiences. Okay. One of the students actually mentioned that this morning. Yeah. In the morning session. Uh, it was a little concerning uh, trying to get classes you need to graduate because they weren't being offered. So, you know, you have to resort to. You have that chicken and egg issue. Mm -hmm. with it's always a tough, a tough balancing act uh, to do that. Because you only have the resources and, and so many faculty and, and, that, and that kind of thing, and then you want to uh, have classes where you may only have two or three students. Uh, right. So then you kind of force to combine sections and that kind of thing. And the students that you that you have that signed up for an NC class, now they're being forced to take an online class, and now they're not happy. And, and so, yeah, it's it's uh, it's it's a it is a struggle, and, and uh, you know we deal with that at my present institution. Uh, but I think. Um, I think what you need to do is to make sure that you're consistent, you know, and that, uh, and so when I first got there, we were doing quite a bit of that. We were canceling classes, combining classes, and the reputation was getting out there that we were, you know, canceling classes all the time. Exactly. And so, um, and so the other thing was that we were not offering enough evening classes. Uh, and so, um, and I said, you know, it, it's, some faculty like this, some don't, but we're here to serve students. And we have to adjust the schedules to provide classes more in the evening than in day, day hours because that's when it comes to us, or on the weekend, and that's what we need to do. Uh, you know, it's not about my personal schedule, it's about ensuring that we address the needs of the community. So, and we're doing some of that right now in my current institution because we our evening program was almost non existent. So we're kind of turning it off right now. And we've seen some, some growth there. We started to explore some things through um, as part of our reaccreditation process. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the questions that came back to us was academic and student success and mm -hmm. what would enhance that. And in January, student services sat down to start looking at some of those things. I believe block scheduling came up mm -hmm. as one of the discussions, transportation, infrastructure in terms of internet connectivity. Okay. As we mentioned this morning, most of our students, I don't know if you all know this, most of our students come here to use mm -hmm. our connectivity. So. Have you done a student survey? We have, we have. 
Those but are, if you can't do something about it, surveying is also, I mean, it's kind of like the bad customer yeah. service model. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but it's good to hear from the students. Yeah, yeah so we, we've tried to do a few things to mm -hmm. enhance mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, the resources are limited too, so you have to deal with that. Right. But uh, again, stretching the dollar and doing the best you can with, with what you have, uh, will you'll see some growth. But uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's a marketing piece. So <laughs> getting our name recognition out there and, uh, and those kind of, and again, it's, it's, I'm, I'm sitting here, this is the only higher education institution on the planet, other than you go up to uh, the Eastern Shore of Maryland, I know the president at the, is it Salisbury University? Yeah. Salisbury, yeah. 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 Dr. Dr. Uh, Eshbach yeah. uh, is up there, and I used to work with her when I was at Fairmont State. But, uh, but when I asked a question, and you were there, I think, about that radius, right. how far do our students travel to come here? And they, they said, well, the average is between 10 and 12 miles. Mm -hmm. I was like, but the person is 70 miles an hour. Mm -hmm. So we're missing 50 miles, so it's not it's not getting out there. So, uh, and you can do the hit and miss. Visit here one time and show up, show up later, but six months later go out there. That doesn't work. People forget pretty quickly. So we need to be consistent. And, uh, it's gonna take some work. Other questions for the community that you have? Um, so, what are you looking for your next president? How about that one? Did anybody talk about that? We sure hope so. I'm sure no one knows. The, uh, <laughs> anyone like to take a stab? I'll take a stab. Okay. I'm looking for someone who is willing to think out of the box mm -hmm. to get the job done. Okay. To serve the students, to serve the, the population. Good. Not this confined, focused area, but just what will it take and the person who is willing. And sometimes that takes a risk. You have to you have to take a chance sometimes to 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 get to to mm -hmm. accomplish your goal. So that's what I'm looking for. So so a calculated risk, right? Exactly. That's that shared earlier on. Calculate risk. Uh, I'm more of a data enabled person, more than data driven. You know, my PowerPoint is data driven. I'm more data enabled. So having data, not to drive my decision making, but to support my decision making to some degree, because uh, again there are other factors that are not. You can't find data are, are, are subjective in nature. Uh, but being data um, informed and data enabled is important. So I agree. Doing your homework, making sure, that, okay, I got a program here that's cost me so many dollars um, per year. Uh, let's see um, where that money's going. You know, how we better use that money um, to support that program. But, um, but you're right. So, so having, um, and I mentioned this, and I know Mr. Holland has heard this before, and some folks up there, but but I am not a behind the desk person. I'm gonna tell you that right now. I am a pretty active, walk around, visual person. Um, I do what needs to be done behind the desk when I have to do it. But, uh, and of course that's part of the job, I, I get that. I do that right now. But people know me as, um, I do, um, let's, let's take a walk meetings. So, uh, cause I think that uh, being confined to an office sitting all the time uh, doesn't allow for me to think outside the box, uh, and so I like to get out, talk with people, talk with students, you know, staff, faculty, just to hear from them, because uh, it also allows me to um, to see what we can do to make things better, some more processes better, those kind of things. But I, I think the idea of, um, yeah, it's you know, a, a desk, a computer, all those kind of things are, are tools to me. I, I use them more to support what I what I do on a daily basis. But uh, but I'm not going to be if, if I'm not behind my desk. Rest assured, I'm talking with somebody, I'm out visiting with somebody in the community um, and, uh, and really selling this uh, school to them and that, that kind of thing, but I'm not, um, uh, I'm not gonna be sitting there eight hours a day pushing paper. Is that what you want? <laughs> no, sir. <laughs> and, and also to expand on that, uh, thinking outside of the box, I would like to have someone who, is not, who will not accept who's never done this before. Mm -hmm. That's a killer to me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, uh, that's part of the thinking, thinking outside of yep. the, yep. the box. Yeah, I should Don't look for reasons to. not to do something. Look for reasons to do something. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah <laughs> what if you do this? Exactly. You're right, but it's a company risk. But do your homework. Sure. Do your homework and, uh, and then launch. Right? 
what's the story I shared about uh, Samuel P. Langley and uh, and um, um, the Wright brothers? You know the story. You, you're in Virginia. Langley Air Force Base. Another name. 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 <laughs> they, they, uh, and uh, I stood, I showed that story last night with uh, with the uh, with the group that uh, met with us for uh, dinner. And um, the story is that uh, Samuel P. Langley was at that time the director of the, of the Smithsonian Institute. He was charged by the, by the um, Department of War to develop an aircraft, a flight aircraft. So he had a, you know, a team of engineers. He's well educated. Um, and then we have these two, two boys come up from, uh, from Ohio, one with three years of high school, one with four years of high school. And then their mechanic, Charles Taylor, uh, developed the engine. And, and with limited resources, um, I think they had like a thousand dollars back back then. Uh, and Lanley had, um, I think it was like a hundred thousand dollars, but they had, he had a whole lot more money. Okay. Uh, and you can see um, a footage or of um, on Langley Field where Sam Langley launched his aircraft and he went into the bay. <laughs> I'm not sure if you've seen that. Mm -hmm. uh, and so the Wright brothers, here they are. So you have some entrepreneurs that think outside the box, uh, and they had success. So, you know, that's what I'm saying. So with the community college is, if you want to look at a comparison, well, we're the Wright Brothers, okay? The Langley's are the four-year schools. That's how I see it. So, uh, so, so they're, they're uh, you know, they tend to be better funded and that kind of a thing. Uh, but back then, especially, we're getting the job done. We're getting people educated and trained and joining the workforce. Uh, so I think that's, um, if I was the, the president, again, I'd have to do a good study on, on what is the, um, the industry here, and how can you support the industry in terms of growth? Um, and again, spreading out beyond 12 miles to get students to come to us from uh, from uh, further regions. What's your quick read? Do you think there are any assets here that we've not leveraged as well as we otherwise should? And realizing you've only been on the ground mm -hmm, for mm -hmm. six hours. Um, gosh, that's a tough question. Not not being here. Um, I think the the where you're located right now, it's it's, it's a great place. It's central, uh, but I think probably getting more more of that out there to the public, the location of the of the school and uh, and the really uh, marketing the fact that it is central, centrally located on the on the peninsula, uh, will help sell sell the sell the school to other markets. Um, but uh, you're doing some some, some great things. I mean, I mean I, I, believe me, I got on on, the, on YouTube and I plugged in Eastern Shore Community College, and I saw some of the video footage from the um, where there's some work done with Wallace Allen and work with NASA and that kind of thing. Uh, but I think that the, that kind of a thing is 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 really using what you already have uh, and maybe stretching out further to get it to reach out to a larger audience uh, would be would be great. Uh, but I do think there's probably been more focus around around this area, it seems like to me. And I'm not sure, I mean, you're, you're from here, but uh, um, but uh, when I heard that, when I heard that about the 12 mile radius, it, it, it somehow went out. We're not doing the, we could do better in that area. They did that, getting that, that to, to go further. So Dr. Jenkins, you had had a question, and then we'll have Roberta's question, and then we'll wrap up. To, uh, to follow up on what on time. you were asking what we were looking for. Mm -hmm. I can only tell you from my perspective, Robert's already hit on it, creative thinker. Mm -hmm. And the second one for me is someone who has a proven record of a problem solver. And I hope you can tell me that you're a problem solver. <laughs> uh, yes, I've been around the block a few times. And so, um, um, you know, we, we, I shared this to you before, uh, an entrepreneur, and I have a more of an entrepreneurial mindset, an entrepreneur is nothing more than a person who sees a problem to solve, that provides a solution to solve. And that's what they do well. If you think about it, they think of all the different entrepreneurs in, you know, in the world that are successful. Richard Branson, and those, those kind of folks. They solve problems and they, oh, we do this. And it just takes off from there. So those are the kind of people that, um, that are not so much the ones that, um, that see a project through the end, okay? But they're the ones that see a problem, provide a solution, and then it just takes off from there. And then they hand it off to somebody else to run with it. And that's what uh, some of those, those folks that are known for their entrepreneurship have uh, done. Um, I'm reading a book right now, and it's called um, "Who um, Who Owns the Ice House?" The, who owns the ice house? It's a good read. It's about uh, creating an entrepreneur's an entrepreneurial mindset. Um, again, being an entrepreneur mindset doesn't mean you have to be an entrepreneur. Is you have to think an entrepreneur. 
And I think we need more of that in the community college, really in higher education as, as, as a whole. Uh, but, um, so yeah, I've, I've dealt with problems and, and I've fixed problems. Some of the solutions were not uh, probably, they work out for the person sitting across the desk from me, but <laughs> sometimes you have to do that. So, you know, it's just, um, and most of the problems that I deal with, and, and you, you sat in the student's present, most of the problems that folks in administration deal with are, are personnel issues. But not so much the technical stuff. It's usually personnel issues. It's a, a problem just to deal with on that, on that front. And so I spend quite a bit of my time um, in addressing those, those, those concerns. But, uh, but yeah, but just, if it's a programmatic issue, um, those are things you can fix pretty, pretty quickly. Um, Technical issues, the same thing. But the only thing that's going to really get you there is do you have the resources to, to spend on, on resolving a technical issue, uh, an infrastructure issue? Uh, but then again, you have to kind of think outside the box here. So I will tell you this um, as president, I, I know early on that there are two people I'm going to become very close with. One is a finance person, the CFO, okay? And the other one is the vice president of academic affairs. I guess now a student affairs chief, okay? Uh, those are the two people that the um, that need to be in the inner circle of the president's office. Because one, the CFO will keep you out of trouble. What gets people in trouble? Finances, right? People get fired over there. It, gets, it puts colleges in, in the bind. So ensuring that the CFO is very, very transparent about the state of the of the budget and the finances of the of the college is something that I'm looking for. Uh, and then making sure that the um, the vice president of academic affairs. Um, is addressing the needs of the community in terms of, of having programs that fit the area. I mean, I can have a, a tremendous program in a, in a certain area, but nobody's getting jobs here. What's the sense of having a program here? You know, they'll be trained here and then they'll move on to something else. Now, I will do that if it was something that was um, viable for the college in terms of bringing in some, some revenue. Uh, maybe there is something we can do like that, and, and, and okay. Lines of program is one that we did in my current institution. So we have what we call the electrical distribution engineering technology program, which is basically line service. Um, and most of those, those students that go through their program, they don't get employed in West Virginia. Some do, but most of them leave the state. Uh, but again, that is a very popular program. And there is a big, big demand in the power industry for those folks who are retiring. Uh, you get a catastrophes like what happened in Puerto Rico. This is a whole bunch of those folks on here. They got pretty well, uh, and so so you know you have to be in tune with what hap what's happening, not just locally, but regionally, and even on the global market, you know, uh, because it's here, so we can't hide from that anymore. Um, so it's not just about building uh, the workforce here, but it's also uh, addressing how we can service other workforces in in different regions and areas too, because they have a need too. And so you know it's. Nursing, and we talk about that. Nursing in West Virginia right now, they, they're short 10,000 nurses. So I can be running nurses, a nursing program day in day out. That's the number we need. Okay, so, uh, uh, but um, so that's something that, that I would have to look at closely to see what the what the market looks here, what it looks like, um, and then working closely with the employers. When I sat down with, um, I'm sure it's true, but um, when I sat down with the uh, the um, chief officer and. Um, and president of Honda Aircraft uh, to talk about their particular needs in, in Greensboro because they, they headquarter the operation there and, uh, and they were getting ready to start production on the Honda jet. <clears throat> so I sat down with him and then I sat down with his vice president of, um, of um, production. And I said, okay, please let me know, what are your projections uh, for this year, two years on the road and five years on the road? So in my head I'm thinking, okay, he might need you know, 150 people this year. He might need another 250 next year. But in five years, he, the person might only need 60 people. So I have to make sure that I don't spend all this energy and the experience up front, and then five years down the road, it dries up, okay? So you have to, when you start planning like that, you have to think ahead and then work your way backwards. Uh, and so that's been a success uh, at Guilford Tech. Uh, I left there and, um, about that program, and, uh, and I sent uh, two of our faculty over to Honda Jet to learn their processes because they, they have two, over 200 patents on the Honda Jet that, uh, that are held in close, in close to the heart, if you want to share. 
Uh, but I said, so I worked with the folks there, and I said, look, can, if I, we send two of our faculty to help you with your production of that aircraft, to learn those processes, uh, so they can teach those students, you know, that, uh, and they were very, very picky in their selection of the uh, students they were hired. Uh, but that worked out really, really well. But, but I'm saying, so establishing those kind of relationships with the employers, um, and believe me, they will share with you uh, what they need to share, because they want to be successful too. And they need those, and they'd rather hire from the local region than the law side. But yeah, so yeah, I, I, I agree with you wholeheartedly. Yeah. Take a little risk and think outside the box a little bit. So we're going to get to the reverse question, and okay. last question besides mine. Right. The, um, Right here at our back door is a runway. Okay. Under leveraged, underutilized. Okay. And buildings that once were utilized to provide servicing for the overall aircraft industry. Do you see any chance, any potential that that could be a new horizon for us here? Um, <clears throat> we talked about this a little bit. Uh, the drone industry, uh, what schools are going to teach maintenance, drone maintenance? Do you know? That's a market that's out there that, um, that they, need, they need people in. Um, to be a drone mechanic or technician pretty much requires the same training as an aircraft maintenance technician would need, because basically they're essentially small aircraft, okay? Uh, and some of those that you see that the military operates um, are not the ones that you find in Walmart. So, but, uh, but the idea is that uh, in order to provide that, um, that training and for those folks to get employment in that, in that arena, they have to be certified by the FAA. Because when they see the thousand feet, <clears throat> now you get into, the, into an area where you get into the airspace. You know, the airspace extends from bottom level straight up into, into the atmosphere and beyond the atmosphere, into space. Uh, and so that's what the FAA is concerned about. Because the FAA, uh, they were birthed out of safety. So they only, they only exist to promote safety uh, and also to promote, which is kind of a, a double-edged sword because they're supposed to promote safety but also promote uh, production and in terms of aviation, right, and, uh, traffic and so on. Um, but so I, I think here, if you, if you if you do our homework and look at the possibilities and uh, and maybe working with uh, NASA, looking at uh, what they're doing with uh, as far as drone work and those kind of things. And other industries, I think uh, you'll see there might be a market here for that. Uh, you have this big agriculture area. Uh, they do they use drones a lot for uh, looking at uh, at uh, surveilling the, um, the the acreage and looking for disease and and uh, for looking at areas that um, you know for it might be possible um, are prone to fires and those kind of things. So now there's some uh, drones. I know West Virginia using drones now to uh, actually go into uh, into the coal mines. To inspect coal mines, uh, if there's an unsafe uh, type of situation, whether it's in a drone there or a robot. Uh, but uh, the point is that, that if you have a strong drone program, I know there's a, what school? I thought there was a school in, in Virginia. I know there's a school in Blue North Carolina. Blue Ridge Aviation. Blue Ridge Aviation, Teresa They have aviation, but they need drone maintenance. Well, and we've started drone classes working in that um, direction, and we've met recently with the local airport about an aviation career awareness event, and we work also with um, Peter Bale, um, who is instrumental in the in manned aerial systems up at Wallops, since they have a... Uh, no, is that more for the flight training program? Was no, it I think so. It's a manned aerial, unmanned, uh, overall... Uh, all-wheel craft and also unmanned navigation. So, but those are the ones that actually operate the equipment. Yes. So they're at a different site. Right. Not where they can. So, right. so a pilot is the definition is being in the seat, right? So we have in the military there are a lot of drone pilots, and they're located somewhere else, but mm -hmm. they're flying the drone. Right. So what I'm saying is that the need, or is it more on the maintenance side where those drones need routine maintenance, or they need some kind of a, they have a, mal a malfunction? Who's going to fix the fix the drone? So I don't know what the market is here for that, but that's something that probably should be looked into. Um, the marine market is another one. Um, I'm surprised there's a, um, a marine technology program here with all the boating and whatnot here. I mean, there's some of that. I saw we got a couple of outboard <coughs> engines back here. We do some of that workforce training. We do training. it with workforce training. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, but um, typically you'll find that in, in a lot of the areas that uh, are by the water, um, there's usually a marine technology program to train those individuals. 
it's the same. It's the same thing as with the you know um, aviation maintenance technician program. Um, you have to get the accreditation uh, from that agency that, that, that does that, um, provides the accreditation. But but I think there's a market for that here too. Um, you know, we, we, we talked about. Uh, <coughs> I'm sorry. We partnered with Rappahannock Community College several years ago to start the mm -hmm. marine maintenance program, mm -hmm. um, and it didn't and what take about, off the what way about, we. Uh, what about folks that have boats and uh, and yachts and all those kind of things? Really, is there anybody that there's uh, down in Cape Charles? Um, there was the yacht center that's just recently been bought by Front Street Yard. Is that what it is? And we've actually Front Kelly did talk with them briefly. It's not been an in depth conversation. But you know about the the different um, workers that they're going to need the what is it the mm -hmm. riggers and mm -hmm. I don't know that oh they're going to need right, electricians right. they're going to need pipe fitters they're going to need so that uh, yeah. you know, upholstery and mm -hmm. furnish you know outfit the inside of the of the mm -hmm. those boats and so on mm -hmm. um, so there's a market for that too I mean mm -hmm. it's, it's you know uh, it depends on what the niche is here so I don't know what that niche is mm -hmm. you know um, but uh, it's be good to explore absolutely uh, and, and you know if you don't ask the question you're not going to know. All right, abbreviated question, abbreviated response. We need to wrap up. <laughs> okay, so I want to switch to a totally different kind of topic okay. in terms of what I'd like to see, and that is more in line with soft skills and mm -hmm. leadership that has to do with, I guess, and it's rooted in the reason it's important to me is that the shore, as I've experienced it over the last 25 years is quite a diverse place mm -hmm. with all kinds of people here culturally diverse racially diverse it's in many many kinds of ways mm -hmm. and it's not always hard or always easy to reach those communities mm -hmm. um, and find out what's going on there and what's up with them and what makes them tick mm -hmm. um, and why they would be interested here so I'm looking for somebody who has very strong uh, communication skills mm -hmm. both talking and listening um, strong collaboration skills uh, and strong ability to connect people because mm -hmm. one of the things we have on the shore is a lot of siloing. There are many people, my friends here know that, in, in lots of different fields, they're doing great things but they, and they might be really connected to each other, but they don't even know about each other. Okay. So I see those three C's of, of communication, collaboration, and mm -hmm. connection mm -hmm. as being hugely important in someone that I, that I think would make a successful person here who could crack down some of the barriers that really do exist. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So that wasn't an abbreviated qu Sorry. question. <laughs> <laughs> as usual. So that's a great thing. Great question. Said, so, not really so we not won't hold sorry. you to an abbreviated I'll, response, I'll, I'll, and this I'll, will be the well, one. Well, no, it's, it's, it's fine. Um, I shared this early on with um, my 30 seconds uh, elevator speech. Uh, and uh, everybody should have their little elevator speech to, to get people engaged in the conversation. Uh, so I always tell folks, you ask, well, so what, what do you do? And I say, well, you know, I, I'm, I'm in the business of uh, training and educating people for, for the better. And uh, I never tell them what I do for a living. Uh, that sometimes it does come out in the conversation. You know, I finally tell them. You know, but uh, but uh, then, it's, then they start asking questions, well, what, what, what do you mean? And then I, then I get into that conversation. So, uh, so I think when you start dealing with folks with uh, different cultures, you have to understand, maybe do a little bit uh, a study of the culture. I'm, I'm, I'm Hispanic, so I have a really strong understanding of, of the Hispanic culture. Uh, I understand some of the uh, nuances with that culture, uh, what's appropriate, what's not appropriate. Uh, so you have to do a little bit of your of homework and get a, a little in on how to address. Uh, I grew up in Gary, Indiana. Um, and so in Gary, Indiana, there's a, there's a large population of African Americans. So, uh, so I grew up on, on the soul music. And uh, a good buddy of mine right now is a, is a current CFO. He and I talk about that. So there is, there is no wall there. Uh, I can identify really with who Smoke Robinson is and all those people that I grew up with, singing their, their songs, that kind of thing. So I think you have to approach people from where they are. I mean, you can't expect them to come to where you are. Uh, so you have to identify with them first and make that connection. Uh, and then the conversation starts as to what you do and you know what, hey, have you considered going back to college? That kind of a thing? Um, oh, no, it's, just, it's not for me. Why isn't it for you? Uh, I don't have the smarts, or whatever, you know? Uh, but again, you have to work with those, with those people. Um, because, believe it or not, um, I was one of those people. First generation college, college student. Um, I joined the military. Didn't know much about higher education, even though I was taking college prep classes in high school. Um, I did well, but, but um, I didn't know much about it, so I joined the military. And it was in the military that I knocked out my uh, community college degrees, 
uh, through the Air Force. And then I started my bachelor's, finished that, and then I started into my master's degree. Uh, retired and finished that when I went to work for Vermont State College and, and uh, pursued my master's and I got my doctorate. And so, so the, the, the point I'm making is that, that you don't know where these people are. And so what we need to do is learn about those cultures and try to get an in with them first and make that connection first, uh, even before you try to make the sale on coming to the college. Uh, because you have to establish that, that, that friendship with those communities. Uh, I can do that. I've done it. Um, and, you know, I, I believe I can speak to anybody, really. Um, I've dealt with state senators, with, with governors. Um, you know, I've given tours to, uh, to governors and so on. So I can go either way. It's, it's because uh, I believe I'm pretty genuine, uh, but I also understand the importance of being diplom uh, diplomatic. Okay? Uh, and uh, as one of my former presidents told me, he said, Rick, loose, let's sink ships. Mm -hmm. So knowing what to say, I'm going to say it. It's important. Uh, and that's why I think if you can do that and uh, enter those communities uh, and, and, and uh, you know, work with them, I think you'll, you'll see some, some exchange there. Yeah. Dr. Richard Thank you. Thank you. So again, uh, we have our uh, feedback uh, from today's session that will be open to hear your comments uh, until 4 o'clock tomorrow. Correspondingly, if you did not have a chance to provide feedback on yesterday's session, you have till 4 today. Uh, it's important for us to hear what you are thinking. So we appreciate you taking the time to come. We appreciate your questions. We appreciate your thoughtfulness. Uh, we're only as strong as we all together can be working uh, to make this the best resource possible. So we thank Dr. Pagan. What we'll be doing now, we'll be rejoining uh, Dr. Pagan with Patricia Pagan, hear about her day, which is very important for us in terms of being able to make certain that the uh, spouse has been able to, to see the showcase of the Eastern Shore. And, and then uh, at uh, 5 o'clock today, the uh, overall their fun filled day will be complete. So, again, thank everybody for coming and we appreciate your support. Thank you. Thank you.